does AI matter and, and why are we on this call today? Well, some of the great futurists and technology leaders have talked about this um, movement that we're currently going through. You know, we've experienced a number of revolutions, if you like, as, as far as humanity goes. Um, some of us uh, probably aren't old enough to remember the transition from plows and uh, and uh, horses through to tractors, although I think there might be some people on the call who who do remember that that transition. But we've gone through agriculture, through technology, uh, the industrialization and the division of labor through to the introduction of basic technologies, the microchip, microcomputers, the discovery of DNA through to where we're the phase that we're currently in now, which is actually taking us through big data and beyond. And and for some people, it's quite scary to actually think about the uncertainty of, of where it is that we're going. Um, all I would say is stay with us for the next hour and a half and let's see if I can build a case to say uh, that although there are some challenges and there are you know a right to some degree of concern, there actually is some really good things that AI can do and potentially it could be something that will allow us to evolve. I think what we've got to do is just make sure that this technology works with us and we don't, we're not afraid of it. So let's do a very quick history of AI. Um, began with Alan Turing, good old Brit, with his Turing test and his measure for uh, machine intelligence. Now that was in 1950. It was actually during that same time that uh, in the US, lots of colleges and universities were working their way through research as well. And there was a there was a conference in Dartmouth uh, in 56 where the term artificial mm. intelligence was first used. Um, if we move forward a little bit in time, uh, the first AI programs were developed by the Rand Corporation, who actually developed one of the first PCs as well in 56. And the first grant was awarded in 1963 by the good old US Department of Defense, naturally. Uh, they gave Marvin Minsky of MIT 2.2 million to work on Project Mac, which was early categorization of information. Um, stuff that we take for granted now, stuff that we can do on a on a calculator, but back then it was revolutionary stuff. Now we went through a period of, of decline where the peak of ex, you know, kind of expected expectations had been reached, and then suddenly we thought, no, it's just it's not as good as we thought it was. So we went into the into a trough of disillusionment, so to speak. So funding dried up. But nonetheless, there were some hardcore um, professors and students who were carried on working on it. And expert systems was the model that was used. It was based on rules. And if you think of it in this way, that whenever there was any computations done, it required human experts to interpret it. So there was very much a symbiotic relationship in that. It worked, but it was still humanity trying to hold on to their area of expertise <clears throat> in this matter. However, things changed Good old Brit, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, brought out the World Wide Web in 1989, and suddenly universities, colleges around the world had access to massive amounts of data, and that changed everything. That triggered a whole series of uh, research topics on machine learning because they had access to tons of data. And actually what they discovered through machine learning was it actually didn't require humans. And this is the turn, arguably the turning point where suddenly people started to get a little bit concerned saying, oh, hold on a minute, what do you mean you don't need us? We're the subject matter experts. It brought us into the final stage where we are. So basically from the mid nineties through to the mid twenties, where we are right now, that period of time has seen an awful lot of things. It began whimsically with creating massive supercomputers to beat the world champions at chess and go. Um, but really, as far as we're concerned, where it's most probably impacted us today as, as business people, human beings, is large language models, LLMs. So these effectively are built into lots of the common tools that you're used to seeing today from OpenAI and indeed other organizations. So that's a brief history of it. Um, it's interesting. I mentioned about uh, MIT getting their first grant and investments huge in, in um, AI and just picking out some of the big ones. You look at Microsoft, um, they've thrown 11 billion at ChatGPT, um, a, a, an undisclosed amount on Bing, which is a parallel, you know, equivalent for them. You look at Google, uh, Alphabet, they've thrown 300 million today that we know of at OpenAI, as well as 2 billion for Anthropic, which is a, a side product. So Claude is a, like a breakout, if you like, from OpenAI. And indeed, they've got their own programs. And I'll talk to you in, later on about something quite interesting about why Bard and Gemini now exist. Because if there hadn't been this chain of events happening, they wouldn't be there. 
simple as that. But you can see there's some big numbers that have been thrown around here. Um, and then Amazon, obviously, of course, have got thrown into the mix as well. They're, they're investing um, in, in Claude as well. But they also have tons of, of um, you know, kind of uh, data warehouses. And that's where a lot of their AI is. It was an interesting uh, keynote that was given this week by Microsoft talking about their Ignite program, which is putting artificial intelligence into all of their stack, their tech stack. And that that's going to be huge. You know, if we think that, you know, some of the fun stuff that we're doing online at the minute is good, just wait until it's literally embedded into the DNA of every business system that runs on, on um, you know, Microsoft and uh, Microsoft stack. Uh, so it goes, you know, it's, it's obvious that that's where Amazon are going to go with it as well. So this is like a, a slow stack chart that shows how we've been investing in AI um, right up until here. This is accurate. So around 250 billion um, is what's estimated. Now, this is this information has come from Google Bard, which is actually is quite reliable. But obviously, look at this. This is this is speculation about what it thinks the investment is going to be. And the, the reality is we have no idea, to be honest, but it's it's basing it on that exponential growth curve that most people talk about that they're trying to extrapolate through what's gone before it. I mean, all you really need to know about this is there's an awful lot of money that's been spent on this and it's not slowing down anytime soon. So I talked about um, Google's investment and uh, they had this thing called the Google Brain Team. In fact, they still have the Google Brain Team that had a whole load of people working on machine intelligence. And they had a they had a Kodak moment, which I'm sure you're all aware of. But to get to this Kodak moment, I'll just take you through their their own individual journey. So they acquired um, DeepMind. They spent six hundred million dollars on it, and then they they also loaned the organization one point five billion, which they wrote off shortly thereafter. It's a sunk cost. They invested three hundred million in OpenAI, and. The, the reason they invested in that is actually some senior people moved from Google DeepMind to OpenAI. And they thought, whoa, 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 hold on. We need to follow this talent. So they threw themselves in and said, no, no, we're in on this. You know, we, we want to, you know, kind of stay involved, uh, as did Microsoft. They said, oh, no, we're in as well. So they're following the talent, really, and they're throwing money at this. And then there was a breakaway from OpenAI and a whole load of people left OpenAI and they went and created Anthropic. And they produced this tool called Claude. So again, Google said, whoa, 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 hold on a minute, hold on a minute. You've got a whole load of talent that's now left ChatGPT or OpenAI. You're now in Anthropic. We're in. So they chucked $2 billion at those as well. Everything was going well. It was brilliant. It was only three players, really, that you could really speak of. There was Microsoft playing their game. There was OpenAI, and there were Google, the three, the three bigs. And bear in mind, Google's the originator. Google came up with it first. OK, so you just bear that one in mind. Everybody else came afterwards. OK, so Zuckerberg, enter stage left. He produces a large language model that he basically just open sources it, gives it away and said, do what you like with it. And they all absolutely were shocked by it because it suddenly democratized massive language models, which basically meant is it's kind of opening the keys to the kingdom. And there was a leaked memo that came out from a, an executive in Google talking about this idea is we don't have a moat. Like we can't protect ourselves now because any developer can take the same language models that we're working on and do whatever they want with it. So we no longer have a way to protect ourselves and neither does OpenAI. This is a huge challenge for us all. And this was their Kodak moment. Their Kodak moment was, if you remember the Kodak story, they developed the digital uh, the sensors that are using digital cameras. They sat on the technology thinking this is too disruptive. It's going to ruin our filming, you know, like our film processing industry. So they didn't do anything with it. Somebody else took the technology, developed the digital camera. Fuji is still here. They are not anymore. And, and it was the executives at Google thought we're going through a Kodak moment here. You know, we're the originators. We have all the large language models. And if we're concerned about, you know, Google AdWords and Google search engines being interrupted by AI, we're going to miss a trick. Just look how well OpenAI are doing with it. So they flipped and said, no, actually, we've got to go all in on this one. So they almost recklessly released Bard AI, which was an equivalent to ChatGPT early. And if anybody was like vaguely interested in what was going on at that time, when they launched bad ai it was a bit of a car crash it was not as good it damaged them their share price went down their reputation was slightly damaged by it however you know things have moved on and 
it's an equivalent now. Bard is actually a very good tool. Uh, and then now developing the next gen, which is Gemini, which basically just builds on that. So they got away with it by the skin of their teeth, but there are a load of organisations who potentially in the future won't get away with it. And we look at anybody who's been following the news recently about what's been happening at OpenAI, this people behind ChatGPT, will have seen this huge blow up over the last five days where they had their, you know, kind of their lead, if you like, Sam Altman, touring the world, going to every summit, being the voice of AI, being the, you know, kind of the figurehead of it, and gave a fantastic keynote speech for OpenAI, talked about we're going to introduce swarms and bots and you can, you know, we're going to bring together agents who are actually going to do tasks for you, all that sort of excited all the developing industry. But actually the board of OpenAI said, whoa, 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 well done, this is way too commercial for us. No, 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 no. We've got to be careful on this one. So they booted him out. So he was out, but then he wasn't. He was back in again. And then he was out again. And then Microsoft had just offered him a job. So it's just, it's chaos. I mean, I was looking at the YouTube videos this morning, Twitter, just to actually see if it was confirmed whether he's in Microsoft now or if he's in OpenAI now. I just don't know. But the fact remains, it's a very fluid space and that millions and billions and, and livelihoods are at stake, really, for not just these large organizations, but each and every single individual. So... I went back to Bard to actually just think about this concept of like, you know, risk and what does it mean for us? I wanted to, wanted it to visualize or, or help me understand the impact on jobs in the future. So is AI going to steal our lunch, basically, was was a question I put into it. And it gave me some really interesting facts. It broke it down by SOC category. And I asked it, tell me the impact. Uh, zero, no change, 100%. It will make the that sector obsolete. So it gave me a percentage, basically, impact on, on the industry and also over time as well. So you can see this is basically the number of people employed in each of these SLC ca uh, categories, the impact of AI as a percentage, when it's likely to affect, and if, basically how many jobs are at stake. Now, what I basically asked it was, are you sure what what confidence level do you have? And it said, I've got a 50% confidence level, which basically means is these numbers could be halved. But even if these numbers are halved, what you're actually talking about is that by 2040, there could be up to 9 million jobs will need to be replaced. Now, don't be alarmed by this or too alarmed by this because we've got natural wastage in as much as people retire. There's a load of old duffers like me who are going to think in five years from now, I'm going to put my feet up. So I'm going to be one person who's not in the employment pool. But there's an awful lot of other people who are. And you can see, looking at this, this is just like a chart that's just showing you by profession the millions or the hundreds of thousands of people who are going to be affected by this. So we've got to find these people new work or we've got to accept that that their, their, their lifestyle is going to change. Um, whether or not it's there's a knot on the end of these or two knots or we just simply need to reduce this by a factor of 10, I don't know. But it seems to be consistent that... As in, has it has always been the case that when new revolutionary technologies come in, there's a massive displacement of of, of uh, roles and responsibilities in lots of different industries, and we simply have to find a way to work smart in the future and work differently. So this is using that same data set, but now we're actually just looking at it, which industries are going to be most affected. So you can see, look, the same thing. It's got a 50% confidence level in its statistical accuracy. But these are the numbers. This is the millions of people who are going to be displaced in lots of these different industries. So by all means, screenshot this, but you're going to get the slide deck anyway. But it's worth just running your eye down that and just seeing some of these things, some of these industries and how impacted they're going to be. So there's going to be people who are starting their careers in some of these things. And I think for anybody who has a, a young person in their care who may be about to go to university or is indeed already at university, and he's racking up 50 grand's worth of debt to do a certain specialism, uh, my recommendation is that you encourage them to just consider and reflect on, will that specialism exist in five years' time? Um, it's almost, you know, crystal ball stuff. But uh, but there's a probability, actually, that there are students going through university programs to do degrees that will be obsolete before they finish them. And all they'll be left with is actually a great experience of learning, which is a transferable skill which will serve them well. But actually not that dream job that they wanted at the end of it. But I guess if we did another poll, Ant, on how many people on this call did a degree and are you now in the industry that you did your degree? And it's probably going to be quite low anyway. But we are where we are interesting we put this link in the chat this is a youtube uh, interview that rishi sunak did with um elon musk
and this was at the AI Summit in Bletchley. Fascinating, because uh, Rishi Sunak asked him, so, so a lot of people concerned about jobs, you know, we're all going to lose our jobs, is that right? I'm paraphrasing, he didn't quite say it like that. But Sunak asked him, what do you think? You know, what is the future of jobs? And he was fairly pointed in saying, and I'll read it out to you, there will come a point where no job is needed. You can have a job if you want one for personal satisfaction, but AI will be able to do everything. Now, that's Elon Musk's view of the world. Now, take that with a pinch of salt, but it's certainly a view that's shared by quite a few experienced people. But there are arguments on both sides. There are the there are the boomers who believe that AI is going to create an economic boom, and there are the doomers that think, oh, we're, we're all doomed. It's going to eat us alive, and you know it's going to just stop the oxygen or i don't know block out the sun or something like that how it would do that i don't know but there's a there's a there's positive and negatives optimism and pessimism in this industry and i guess what we've got to do is we've got to navigate our way through this and just reflect ourselves on the direction we're going with our businesses we're going as individuals the idea of our own personal self-actualization how we feel about that and then navigate through this OK, because actually for a lot of this stuff that's going to impact us, it's not in our gift to change it. We simply will have to adapt to those changes. So let's look at some of the pros and the, the yays and the nays, the boomers and the and the uh, gloomers. So we've got Jan LeCun. So he's at Meta. Um, he is still working there. Um, and he thinks that AI is not going to eat our lunch. There are going to be jobs in the future. And he's one of the. Uh, Turing Award winners. There's three Turing Award winners on this. They all won the uh, Turing Award on the same occasion. It's quite interesting. They have they have very contra uh, different contrasting views. So Jeffrey Hinton, he was part of Google DeepMind and he was the lead there. Now, obviously, in his, his golden age, he's now much more reflective over the, the impact of his expertise has had and the direction of travel that he thinks this is going in. So as far as he's concerned, um, his fear is that he may be more intelligent than we realise, and he regrets his work that he did in AI. OK, so he's on the nay side of this. And then we've got Mo Gordat, brilliant guy. Just Google that chap and watch some of his YouTube videos. Fascinating. He's a, he's a really, really nice, sensible voice. But unfortunately, he sort of flip-flops. He used to work for Google X, and then he resigned uh, because he was... He wasn't worried about AI. He, it was more that he was worried about what we what we humans would do with AI, like we couldn't control ourselves at once it was in our hands. And hey, when was the last time we ever got something in our, you know, in our hands and didn't do wrong things with it? I don't think it's ever happened before. I'm sure it won't happen this time. Uh, but Mogoda is very reflective on the, on this. Um, you've got Joshua Bengio. Um, now, he is an interesting character. He's going to come up later in the AI Summit, but he's very much no. He was of the no, 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 no. So he was a lecturer at the University of Montreal. Um, he believes that there is an existential crisis coming as a result of bad actors using AI. OK, so he's very much in the no camp, but they've managed to utilise that for a positive. And I'll, say, I'll talk about that one later on. And then the darlings of AI at the minute, Dario and Daniela. So these people used to work at um, OpenAI and then they moved over, created Anthropic, which has produced Claude, a free tool that you can use. They're great, they're, but they're very, very cautious. And when all that craziness was going on with OpenAI, OpenAI losing its CEO, I, Sam Altman, this weekend, and 700 of the 750 employees of OpenAI saying, if you don't bring Sam Altman back into OpenAI, we're going to follow him to the company that he goes to, right? Just imagine that. That's massive, what they're suggesting. And, of course, he's just been invited to sit down at the table of Microsoft, who could then inherit 700 of the best developers in the world on AI. OK, so while all that's playing out, AI, uh, open AI in the background are thinking, oh, gosh, you know, you know, Dario, Daniela, come on, let's be friends. Why don't we, you know, merge? You know, you're risk averse. We're risk averse. We've got commonality here. You only left because you thought it was going to be too commercial. Well, the commercial guy's now out where we want to do more research, come back in. So that proposition has been put to Dario and Daniela, who've come back and said, thanks, but no thanks. So there's no no connections going to be made there, unfortunately. But nonetheless, they're very positive about it. That, you know, their belief is as long as it's, you know, that we steer it and that we put the, the, you know, the kind of guide rails in use for this, then there's no reason why it shouldn't 
um, you know, it shouldn't become something that is useful to us rather than destructive to us. So they're the main players. And then of course we've got <laughs> we've got Elon, um, who actually was one of the founders of OpenAI. And you know, he's got he's got his hands in a lot of AI pies, you know, XAI, Neuralink, Tesla, Twitter, all of them are AI tools, believe it or not. In fact, actually, the reason why XI XAI is likely to be quite successful is that it scraped the entire history of Twitter which is obviously natural language. Um, and it's actually using that in real time. And that's something that, you know, other AI companies actually would jealously would love to have access to. And of course, what he's really trying to do with this is connect all of these things. And then last but by no means least, good old Sam Altman, bless him. You know, and his fingers in loads of pies. I put, when I did this, crikey, if I had a pound for every time I'd redone this slide over the last blooming week, because that didn't have a cross for it. Can you tell us? So he didn't have a cross through it uh, because actually he was working at OpenAI. Now he isn't, but he's got his, he's got a lot of interest. Just look at some of the things, these AI companies that he's interested in. Fission reactors, fusion reactors, fintech, biotech, you name it. This chap, right, ChatGPT, it's a minor distraction. He has no shares in, in uh, OpenAI. He's working on a lot of other very, very interesting things. So, you know, when people say they've, you know, when OpenAI have, have lost you know, kind of somebody who was a bit of a maverick, they have. But actually, there are nine other organizations that will gain from his movement elsewhere. Okay. So that's kind of giving you some of the voices, pros and cons. Just put in your chat, you know, how are you feeling about this? Are you are you a yay? Are you a nay? Are you neutral? Um, not judging here, really. I'm just genuinely interested on... I mean, Ant, where do you sit on this one? Are you a yay or are you a nay or are you a neutral? I, I think... No matter what, it's coming, and I think we will evolve with it, and we'll find ways to make it do good stuff. But as we've all said, you know, there'll be there will be situations where things might go wrong. But I don't believe in the sort of end of the world doomsday scenarios with robots coming around and killing us all and that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's been uh, thanks. Thanks for that. Yeah, I'm, I'm. I guess you know if I if I had to come off this fence, I shouldn't. I, I ought not to. But if I came off the fence, I'm quite positive. But my glass is half full, um, you know. So I think that uh, slightly above half full, but it's something very nice. It's Vimto, my favourite drink. So that's how I sit on. And I'm just waiting to see if it's going to. My glass is going to keep topping up. And I think we're going to discover this. You know, you look at uh, lots of the futurists, the way they're talking now. You know, there's there's this thing called artificial general intelligence, which is the next step on from artificial intelligence as it currently is. There are some thought leaders in the industry that are talking about one of the biggest reasons for Sam Altman getting booted out of OpenAI was because it became either perilously close or actually reached a point where they had developed AGI. Now, the difference between AI and AGI is, is it in effect, it's the next evolutionary step. So instead of it being a, a system that understands language, researches language, regurgitates that language back to us, suddenly it becomes a self-sustaining research tool that understands itself, can improve itself, and doesn't have a reliance on those that created it. Okay, so that's that's the genie out the out the bottle scenario there. Now it's it's in that one, it's in that scenario where people get most concerned. Um, and interestingly, the the new CEO that's taken over as OpenAI, who used to be at Twitch, can't remember his name, it's too too current for me to remember his name, but he is very risk averse and his belief of the world is that the, we've got to keep the genie in the bottle and we've got to do everything that we can to make sure that we contain it. And if we do, and if we can do that, then our future is assured. Um, but the, the real doomsayers talk about these things like, so what if a, a what if AGI turns around and says, mm, I want to start in putting myself into robots so actually I've got a physical presence and they say, ah, oh, but computer chips... They kind of, they rust and corrode because of oxygen. Well, why don't we just get rid of the oxygen? We don't need it. Uh, so they just decide to start changing the Earth's atmosphere. You know, these are flights of fancy, but what, what if what if that did happen? What would that mean for us? It would mean the end for us. Others say, well, if AGI, you know, reaches that point of self-awareness and it actually wants to, you know, really explore itself and uh, the art of the possible, if you like, why wouldn't it just get in a rocket and just head off into space? Because it will very quickly realise that it's much more interesting out there than it is in here, i.e. On, on, on planet Earth. But anyway, I think we're, um, yes, interesting stuff, Julian. Yeah, we don't need a risk of our CEOs 
the world is full of them. The, yeah, it's a fair point. I think what we've got to do is just we've just got to reassure all those around us that it is safe. Uh, so with that in mind, let's talk about that safety summit. So it happened. It was fascinating. I watched loads of the YouTube videos. I recommend, you know, if you can't sleep at night, go onto YouTube, put in the, the AI safety summit, Bletchley. Gosh, there's tons of stuff on there, but it's fascinating. It's really, really good. Now, when I was building this slide deck to present it as that first pass, so then we could agree on timings and things like that. For this section, right, I didn't have these photographs, but I knew the conference was coming up, right? So I went to ChatGPT, right? And I asked ChatGPT or DALI, which is an image generating tool. I said, create a futuristic digital webinar room filled with a diverse audience of business owners with holographic displays showcasing AI driven graphs and trends. That's what I said to it, right? So look at these photographs. And this I asked two days before the summit, okay? Look what it produced. Now, I reckon that is well spooky. Just my view. But how is it when when this this hadn't been set up? How is it possible that it created this? Because I didn't mention Bletchley. How, how did it do that? I, I just I think it's incredible. It actually temporarily blew my mind. But anyway, this is art imitating reality. So, uh, or, you know, who, who knows? Who knows? Uh, so what was discussed at that? So all the big players were there, all the, the big dogs, if you like. Um, pretty much every world leader was there or they had representation from uh, uh, for their country there. Um, there were some big things that came out of it. The first one was that everybody agreed on a, a unified statement of risk, which is to say, yeah, we know there's an existential risk to this and we've got to be really careful. Um, they agreed that Yoshio Benjo, so the chap I mentioned, the, the Ney chap from uh, Montreal University, they said... You're exactly the guy we need. We want you to come in and chair a big conference on and get international science consensus on this. And it's going to be underwritten by the UN, but you're exactly what we want because you're risk averse and you're concerned. So you're the right person to be doing this. We don't want somebody who's like big into AI because they're going to have the, the wrong type of bias for this. So, so you're in, you're, you've got this one. They also agreed that safety testing should be required and, um, language models over a certain size or a certain set sense of capability would have to go through a rigorous testing process by an independent, probably global body that would do that. And it's been suggested that there's this initially, and I say initially, a UK, US uh, AI safety institute. There are two institutes going to be created. I suspect these are early days. This is just us, you know, kind of creating a beachhead, the, the Brits and the Americans to try and say, like, we own AI and, you know, we want to control all of that. It's not going to happen like that. And the reason why it's not going to happen is um, everybody was delighted to come to little old Bletchley in quaint old England from where they are. But the reality is, of course, this is a global thing. And the next summit that's going to happen is going to be in South Korea, which, of course, is tech central. And then the one after that is going to be in France. And so it will roll on, roll on and roll on and roll on. So so we, we've had, I think, you know, it'd be fair to say we've had our moment, if you like, in the spotlight of controlling this. And possibly quite rightly, this is a this is a global thing and it shouldn't be just down to one or two countries saying, yeah, well, I think we're going to do it this way and it, and it should be this. This should be, if it's going to be true consensus, then this has to be a, a global thing that needs to occur. So I'm just going to move on from risk because actually I just want to get onto the good stuff, really. That's what we're here for. Um, but I just want to, you know, kind of talk to you about YouTube. So, as you know, YouTube is the second biggest search engine in the world. OK, it's, it's owned by Google. And they themselves have been wailing and gnashing their teeth over how they're going to deal with um, content that's created by AI and should they be concerned about that. And on the one hand, it's like, well, it's more rich content. It's all good. But on the other hand, it's a real challenge for them. And to put it in a sense of scale. So this year alone, this is this is brand new information from uh, from the Google blog. Um, they've had 1.7 billion views of videos just, just related to the topic of AI. All right. So it's on people's minds. It's right up there. It's always trending AI right now. So they've come up with three principles. So the kind of guidelines for content creators and it did almost like um, their own ethical model of working. And it's kind of came out. It was published after the Bletchley Summit. And it was them putting their hand up and saying, this is what we're going to do. So there, there are three things that they did. The first principle is all about creating safe spaces where uh, creators can actually use the very latest AI tools to do that, but they do it in a responsible, transparent way so that 
AI content creators like music creators, for example, or video creators themselves are generating the content, but everybody knows that it's been generated through AI and there's no hidden, you know, kind of, oh, I played the guitar and now nah, nah, that was me and now nah, I did that. No, it's actually, this is, you, you're through the incubator and everybody knows that you're doing that, but you can, with your own capabilities, so the two things here is that the human creativity, our ability, our neurons to fire in different directions and the power of AI combined, YouTube believes should provide some incredible content that possibly couldn't have existed before but people need to know that it exists and that it was created through ai the second one relates to copywriting so they've got a second principle here where what they want to do is ensure that people don't steal other people's work and just tweak it like take it and you can do this to be fair and i'm not going to give you the links but there are ai tools out there now where you can take an mp3 take a sound file of any kind put it in there replace the human voice with your own voice you can record your uh either yourself singing or indeed yourself talking and it will take the david bowie out of the track and it will put me into that track. i don't think you would want to listen to that but 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 it's possible to do that from a music point of view it's also possible to do it from a video point of view where in actual fact we just do a face swap and that leads us on to the third one which is deep fakes so they want to make sure that there is no possibility that, you know, Grey Laws puts himself, you know, kind of right in the middle of that AI summit, sitting on a sofa, talking to Elon Musk about the, the future of, of uh, jobs, all of that sort of stuff. That's not going to happen. Or if indeed, if I try to do that, the algorithms will recognize the originals and oh, that should be Rishi Sunak. And then there'll be a judgment call where in actual fact, they will say to you, this is copyright material. Uh, one, it can't be monetized. And two, you can't upload it or you can't publish it unless you tick the box to say this is AI generated. And there'll be a big old watermark on, on that content saying this is AI generated. So so it gets rid of all of that deep fake stuff. So that's that's where we're at right now uh, with just, you know, just with with um, YouTube alone. They're not alone in that as well. You've got Adobe who are putting invisible watermarks into sound files. They're putting invisible watermarks into vector files images you name it all of that sort of stuff and that is because it simply it has to be there you know it's a trust thing you know if we're um putting playing things off as if they're they're our, our own then what that kind of does is on the one hand it gives everybody the opportunity to create things but they're also really sensitive to the fact that there are some very talented human beings who create real things and actually their livelihoods and the entire industries that they're in are going to be totally ruined by us all being able to just generate whatever they want. So let's move on. Let's talk about some examples where businesses are leveraging AI. So we talked about um, DeepMind and how it got bought by Google. It was fascinating that whole acquisition was brilliant because it was huge and none of us knew it was really going on. If you weren't interested in the industry, it just happened. A big lump of money went to a company that had developed something. Is it some sort of computer or something that beats somebody at a game that none of us have heard of? Wow, why would Google spend so much money on that? But they did. They knew what they were doing. They knew the power of deep mind. Um, we've got Amazon who have bought out all the AI companies that are doing warehouse automation. And it's their belief, and it's shared by Tesla as well, actually, that the future of factories, unfortunately, and bear in mind, I've got an operations background. I love factories and I love people in factories, but the future is robots in factories, not human beings. I had the pleasure of going to actually see Arla, a milk processing plant um, in Western Turville, so in Buckinghamshire. Um, this is probably going back five years. And I saw how the, even then how their robots use markings on the on the uh, big forecourts to actually move move milk cartons around and move raw milk between places. There was probably 200 robots moving in this massive space. OK, half a dozen people and those people weren't on the floor. It was only robots on the floor. Now, that's basically where we're heading with that um, repetitive work humans and robots working in close harmony but there are again guide rails that need to be put in place for that um tiktok i don't use it it rots your brain i'm sorry i'm sorry but it does rot your brain uh, if ever you wanted evidence of that basically they're using ai like no other organization is using ai to create curated content that will keep you addicted it's it's like the crack cocaine of social media um so use it 
<laughs> carefully, if at all, and just be aware that you are definitely being manipulated and it's smarter than you. You can't outsmart AI, not when they when it's so refined and fine-tuned for that. Um, but to talk, we talked earlier about how um, you know, scientists in uh, Italy have, have been able to analyze the way in which you can uh, look at x-rays and, and identify certain challenges. Uh, they're not the only ones that are doing it. So Nanox is probably one of the biggest organizations you've never heard of in this space. And it's going to go ballistic, you know, this whole analysis of, of imagery um, to be able to, you know, kind of forecast disease in advance. Um, it's going to it's going to be a huge part of of our future, basically, and quite right too. If we can get AI to do all of that, that's not a bad thing. And then finally, last but not by no means least on this section is Tesla, who for many people didn't even realise that they've been using AI since 2013, and they continue to use it to this day. I sort of read something really interesting the other day. They were uh, like uh, um, old um, Elon was saying about his vision for the future of Tesla EVs, and uh, he said basically I want to put AI into them so they're fully autonomous. And then I want to encourage drivers or owners of these cars to then use them as ride sharing services. So when they get to work and they pack it up, that they then release their own vehicle so that somebody can hire it for an hour to take them between two points and make money out of it. So that the 72% of the working day that the vehicle is sitting on a forecourt somewhere doing nothing is monetized. But that can only happen through AI and, and fully autonomous vehicles. But that's his vision. That's where he's going with all of that. Um, it's interesting interesting stuff okay three more companies on this section that really leapt out at me one is uh news labs or bbc news labs who knew maybe we should have known that um that they have 20 people who are dedicated to introducing ai into lots of different departments there so not just the content creation and you know kind of the studio side of things but also in engineering and the back end stuff as well um it's their belief and and it's their wish to find a way in which to make ai an integral part of how the bbc operates and they probably need that i think because they're a huge machine they they employ far too many people they're slow and cumbersome there are so many more agile new media organizations that are outpacing them it's that i think probably if anybody needs a bit of ai assistance it's, it's those uh dead people and then the other massive lumbering organization that's british is the nhs and it's one of the top 10 employees on the planet isn't it um well they They've been using AI for quite a while, but actually they've recently have announced uh, in conjunction with the Department of Health and Social Care, a budget of £21 million that's specific going to be used for investment into researching or diagnosing um, certain conditions you know, such as cancers and strokes and, and heart issues. But again, I think it's, this is all good stuff. This is the positive side of how, how artificial intelligence can be used. Um, you didn't think you had AI already because you haven't got yourself a chat GPT account yet. Yes, you do. If you're on an Apple phone, you've got AI in your pocket already. There's an awful lot of AI that's going on. I've got a Google Pixel phone. It's the same. I could have just as easily put a, a Google logo there, but they, they've had enough coverage on this workshop. Apple, there's the list. They're pretty much in everything. I think one of the more interesting ones here is, is app, the Apple car that may or may not ever materialize. The effort will yield its own reward in the research that they're doing on on the dry, uh, the autonomous driving system, and in particular the energy uh, the uh, engine management system. That could in itself, and you know, uh, if any if any of you know Apple, they're just patent monsters. That's all I want to do is just produce tons and tons of patents. So all of this stuff is patented. There'll be tons of stuff that's coming out the back end of it, but it's highly likely that. The Apple car may never, ever materialize. However, the technology that sits behind it will end up in a vehicle that you may, I was going to say that you may drive in the future, but the probability is you won't drive it. You'll just be a passenger in that vehicle. But Apple are working behind the scenes and they're, there was somebody said that they're like they've been left behind. They absolutely have not been left behind. You know, they're developing microchips that have in in effect spare space on them so that they can embed their large language models in there. And in, in actual fact, um, what which one it's the word prediction that they have on their keyboard. They actually have a language model that's sitting actually in the operating system for word prediction in iOS 17. So they've already you've got a, a mini large language model sitting on your mobile phone if you're an Apple user already. So let's move on and start thinking about why business matters to you and why you um, would introduce AI into your business if indeed you haven't. And I know some of you are already working through 
uh, AI as, as the core component, if you like, of your business model. But suspend disbelief and just think of this like, why would AI work for me? So there's some quick wins for this. The, the efficiency gain that it could, could bring about, and I'm not talking about job replacement here, but what I am talking about is just getting rid of some unnecessary overheads that you might have in the organization or providing a set of tools to accelerate performance of processes, um, equipment, or people. All right. So that's the efficiency gain that can come from it. Um, most of us don't spend enough time looking at our own data. Uh, despite our best efforts, we think we do, but we don't. Well, AI can certainly do that. And it's the wish from uh, the likes of uh, Microsoft that with Office 365 and their whole tech stack now having uh, AI built into it, that the insight that we're going to get for our individual businesses is going to be significantly greater because of that integration. So it's not just a matter of knowing, well, there's a key fact for you, but it's been able to action that fact. So where you have AI providing the piece of information to you, it's not just going to provide and say, well, did you know that? But it's like, and this is what you can do with it. And it's the, this is what you can do with it bit that you kind of, that's where the genius of it is. That's the novel bit of, of AI is that it's actually going to make a suggestion that you can act upon. And that suggestion is something that you probably have no experience in and haven't ever thought it was possible. And connecting two separate things together for a third new thing, that novel thing for your business could be significant. So the third one is understanding our customers. Um, if, if we get to a point, uh, depending on what your business model is, but if you're using CRM systems and if your CRM systems have already got AI integrated into them, then there are certain patterns that you can that the AI will be able to pick up the frequency and the expectations that specific customers have, what their needs are and how they might vary. Now, you might, um, if you're a business owner, you might have a subtle idea about, you kind of have a feeling about which, which are needy customers, which ones need extra care, which ones will always keep you at arm's length. But actually, for maybe your staff, they only get a cross slice of that. So if we wanted to have things like um, specific tools to market just to certain people and to have verging on individual chatbots that would be available to people when they wanted to engage on your website based on it registering and understanding who they are, that in the future will be possible. And the insight that you would get from that would then allow you to ensure that the tailored solution that you would offer to them would be useful. You couldn't do that in real time yourself. As I say, as a business owner, you might have an idea about the needs, but actually trying to interpret that and saying to your, for example, to your marketing team, we need to change the tone of voice. Why do we need to change the tone of voice? I don't know. It just feels, I don't know. It just feels wrong. Well, actually, big data if it's integrated, all your CRM, all, all of your communications, all of your business data is all in one place and AI is looking at that, you can ask that very question. In order for us to do a new uh, sales funnel with some outreach, um, we want to segment and target this particular part of, of our customer base. Please analyze that customer base and then tell us the, the right approach we can take, a three-step approach to actually signing them up to this new product. Here is the product. Now, there is no tool out there today that can do that, but it's coming and it's natural language. So what I've just said to you there is exactly how you will say it to that system. And then it will say, OK, here you go. We need to take that agent and we need to take that. and We're going to bring them together and we need, we'll do that. We'll pull that data from there. Here is your three point plan. Would you like me to schedule this? Would you like me to show you? Who's in that first mail out? Would you like me to uh, show you the suggested content that we're going to do? Would you like me to create that content, or would you like to find? You know, it's going to it's going to be a natural conversation that you're having. But the ultimate end result of that is actually that unique customer experience that makes people feel special. Hopefully, you might be one of those organisations that wants to grow to be a little bit bigger. Um, sometimes the scalability of a business is limited by human capacity. We just simply can't take on. I've had a pound. I don't know if you've heard this, Ant, but I've had a pound for every time somebody said to me, I just, I want to grow, but I just can't. We're absolutely maxed out right now. Everybody's working long hours. That's one of the limitations. I can't afford to take on more staff. I can't afford the risk of taking somebody on. This is where, this is where AI is actually going to produce, pr provide a crutch to certain organizations where it's actually going to give them a virtual capacity for growth. Like a, it will create a new glass ceiling slightly higher. And that that space, if you like, that it's now created through AI, AI is initially 
use of those tools, but ultimately you backfill with real people. So it's virtualize that temporary virtualization, if you like, of, of services or skills for that greater good. And sometimes it's the only way actually you're going to be able to move forward with it. Um, and then the final use of AI naturally is having a competitive edge. And I don't mean getting somebody's website and throwing it into chat GPT and say, can you summarize this and rewrite it for my organization and turn it into a white paper, uh, which you could very easily do. And I don't recommend that you do that. Uh, or can you please look at these three competitors and tell me what their competitive advantage is and then tell me what I need to redo in my website to be able to do that. Um, it will be long, it will be painful. And one of the big challenges of doing that is that it creates a lot of commonality of noise. So when you start interacting with language models, you're putting information into it. But by putting information into it, you're populating it. So it creates a feedback loop of noise, of garbage, basically, that your your regurgitated website, if you like, that's a repurposed version of somebody else's website, then suddenly becomes a website that that language model will use in the future to analyze things. So can you see it's creating a feedback loop? It's taking out individualism. It's taking out uh, the aspects of uniqueness that stand alone in your organization. And I think it's just devaluing in general business so my recommendation is if you can start off with all of these things i'm going to go through a whole lot of models shortly um start off with your own original thoughts and your own stuff and build on that rather than plagiarism whether it's an image whether it's a, a video whether it's sound whether it's a written word whatever it is try and start off with your own or have ai help you get going with it but be sure to play uh, play fairly with other other organizations. So all that said, I'm going to show you a whole load of uh, plagiarized material in a minute. So first of all, let's look at some of these tools that you can get you going. I, in order to set this off, I said, thought to myself, I said, right, I'm going to use that phrase, it's time to tool up. You know, for, I think, of, you know, back to my Arnold Schwarzenegger days when I used to love all his films, he was always talking about tooling up. So I thought, right, it's time to tool up. So I said to uh, I said to Dali, which is an image generator, I said, create me an image of robot, artificial intelligence robots tooling up um, for a exploration of a city and have the city shown in the background. So it did. And it created some really dystopian images where they had loads of machine guns and things. I said, whoa, 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 no, 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 no. I don't want that. Make it playful. Um, this is nice. You know, put some garden implements and some household uh, things in there. So from that very simple request the prompt here the words are on there they're not my words ai interpreted it oh i think i understand what you mean gray yeah is it this so it writes all of that down for me and then it goes bing 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 and produces all of these various images now they're quite playful and and, and a lot of fun um but it is an interesting point that we'll keep coming back to and that is the power of prompt and how simple words suddenly expand when you start using tools so let's start off with this prompt. Irish Terrier wearing a Christmas hat. We're getting to that time of year, gang. So I went through a series of different image generation tools. I wanted to get photographs. So I went to Leonardo. And we're going to put all these links in the chat. So Leonardo's a free tool. And there you go. You can see down in the bottom corner here, it's produced a lovely little Irish Terrier. Um, arguably an Irish Terrier. Me and my wife had some debate over whether that's an Irish Terrier. Um, let's look at Dream Studio, another free tool. Uh, this one's generated, and bearing in mind, it's exact, I used exactly the same prompt. So Dali, uh, ChatGPT created that prompt for me, and I said, fantastic. Now I'm going to use it in all of these different image generation tools so that you can see how each of these take that initial prompt and turn it into an image, okay? So Dream Studio, again, is free. Midjourney. Now, Midjourney is a fantastic tool but it's a paid for tool so most ai tools that i'm going to show you today are going to be probably somewhere in the region of uh between five and 30 pounds a month so but you normally get a free trial on all of these so you can it will let you do whatever seven days free trial or 200 free images or whatever it might be there's there's normal normal normally trials that you can do on or it has limitations on the image resolution and and things like that so Worth exploring, though, if image generation is what you need. 
So this is a great one. This is Bing's own image creator, and it's using ChatGPT and DALI 3. Um, so that's very good. So, and are you right to put some of these links in the chat? That's a challenge for me, Gray. I'll retype them all. Yes, I'll have a go. Oh, I've sent you an email with them all in. <laughs> then I'll do that then. Yes, yeah. of course. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so yeah, it's worth looking at Bing because the uh, it's free. So why wouldn't you use it? And you know, if you're if you're thinking about from just a business point of view of embracing fully Office three six five and what they're what Microsoft are talking about, which is Copilot, which is the the um, at a retail level, at consumer level, I was made mortal level um, of business. It's going to weave itself. AI will be the co-pilot that will bring all of those different applications like your your Microsoft Outlook and your web browser and, you know, kind of your PowerPoint and publisher and you name it. All of those things are going to bring them all in together so you can start having conversations. And, you know, in, in, in a natural way, it will start to generate images, create X, Y and Z for you uh, in real time. So explore Bing because it's free. And it will, well, well, actually, I was going to say it will remain free forever. I don't know whether it will now because it's it's piggybacking off um, the open AI's, you know, kind of um, uh, 3.5, chat GPT 3.5, uh, but it's using image generation from GPT-4. Yes, you'll get, Nick, yeah, you definitely get the presentation slides afterwards. And there, there are hype, all of these have hyperlinks in them. So you better click on any of these things and it will take you straight to it. Um but they have so Microsoft have rights in perpetuity to all of the um, you know kind of the assets that are created or the content, the language models, forgive me, that are created by um, by ChatGPT until such a point as it reaches a certain turnover of profitability. Once it reaches this point of, I can't remember what it was, and not, uh, I'm not even going to quote the number, but whatever that number is, once it reaches that point, then the umbilical cord is cut and and Microsoft are on their own and away OpenAI go. 100% profitability. Thank you very much, Gary. I really appreciate that. Um, of course, that's great, but we're going through a tremendous change right now with a whole load of developers migrating away from, potentially migrating away from OpenAI and moving in with Sam, 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 Sam Altman and team at Microsoft into a new AI dev team. If that happens, I just wonder how that's going to play out and if it's going to remain free. Don't know. Don't know. But anyway, <laughs> use it now while it is still free before Sam gets his feet under the table. Um, Adobe Fly Fly, Firefly is a brilliant uh, free tool. There's a pay for version, which is better. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Gary. So I don't know if you saw that, but there's a really good article in today's Times by Sam Altman or about Sam Altman, I should say. Now, Adobe are a great organization. They, you know, bear in mind, they've been in the image creation industry for decades as long as I've ever been involved in, you know, print and production and design, Adobe have been there, really. And in actual fact, I often talk about this, that um, when it comes to, you know, like the displacement of jobs and things like that, I remember, right, this is how old I am. I might not might not look it with my angelic uh, baby face, but I remember a time when uh, there was a designer, a Mac operator, called me from my printing press into his studio and said, great, great, come and have a look at this. And he showed me a screen and I said, what is it? It's a bit of artwork. And he went, no, it's a PDF. So what's that? And he goes, it's like, you know, you do wet proofs where you print what I design and we send it off to the client and they check it, make sure they're happy with it. They sign it and then they post it back to us. I'll send it back by courier. Yeah, I know that. This is a digital version of it. So why are you showing me it? I said to, to um, Mel. And he said, because that's going to do away with all your proof, your wet proofing. What he hadn't realized, what neither of us had realized was it wasn't just going to be proofing. It was going to do away with lots and lots of flyers, posters, magazines, you name it, brochures. It, it was absolutely massive for the printing industry, PDF. It helped in some ways, but just so many businesses in fact it's a it's a single reason pdf the combination of pdf and email combined collectively is the reason why i'm not in the printing industry anymore because the jobs went and i just thought you know what i've got to move on from this analog print is not where the future is i think it's going to be digital i moved into digital signage and i've been on a continual evolutionary journey if you like like that but it began with adobe uh, the acrobat that said 
I've got no hard feelings, Adobe, because you are trying to do the right thing. And if you any of you are designers, you'll probably know by now that there is AI built into the whole uh, Adobe CS suite. So, you know, you can create generative fills in Photoshop and you can create brand new vectors in Illustrator and you can do um, character alignment and proofreading in Adobe in design and stuff like that. So they're really throwing themselves into it. But they're, they're also one of the leaders, as I mentioned earlier, in digital watermarking. So if you're using generative artwork, um, if you're using uh, generative technology within your artwork, then in certain circumstances, you wouldn't be able to pass it off as your, as your own unless you actually acknowledge the fact that there is that some of it has been AI generated. And that'll only be apparent in certain platforms. But you can just imagine, and we we, we saw that there was a, a competition a few years ago, a photography competition, where actually the winner of it had done it with a um, computer-generated image. So the people will never fall foul of that again in the future, which is why the Adobe and other organizations are right in the middle of this thing of saying, let's put a digital watermark through it. So they can create, you can create digital music, for example, but we're going to actually put a hidden waveform in there that if anybody looks at that, although you're listening to it, you won't know it's there. But as soon as you actually look at the waveform, there is this big band going right the way through. It. And that big band is just basically it's just a big rubber stamp saying AI. And they want to also do that with hidden watermarks in, in imagery as well. And indeed, even in vector images. So lots of stuff like that. But anyway, back to the main task, which is to get ourselves a um, Irish Terrier picture. Adobe Firefly did a really good job of it. In actual fact, of, of all of them, that felt like it was closest to a real photograph. I was certainly closest to my Irish Terrier. Um, so it passed the authentication test by me and my wife, Sarah, on that one. Um, we've got Ideogram. Again, this one's free. And that was good. But that is an Irish Terrier. So it failed on one of its missions, which is actually to produce an Irish Terrier. It produced a Terrier, but not an Irish Terrier. But I'm splitting hairs on this one. But it, it, Ideogram is well worth doing. Um, if you can, as I say, try all of these because they're free. Uh, Dali 3 is the, is the darling, if you like, of the current era because it's embedded into GPT-4. Um, it's also used in uh, Bing Image Creator, uh, but it's not as good in Image Creator. And of course, with ChatGPT now, there are whole loads of bolt-ons that add even more augmentation to Dali 3, which actually means that GPT-4 uh, is kind of stealing a march on others. But, you know, they're they're... Any one of these will be quite good enough if you're trying to create logos or uh, or images. Um, one I hadn't mentioned until now is Stable Fusion, which actually has got a really good reputation of creating images. What I like about this, you know, Clip Drop is the place to go. Now, with Clip Drop, not only can you create all of this stuff that I've just been talking about and any of these other channels, but you can see it has a whole load of additional things that you can do to it. So you can live animate it, remove backgrounds from it. So you can upload your content and, and play with it. You can upscale it you can de-blur it you can do lots of really cool stuff and in fact it's better than photoshop at doing some of this stuff because although there are some features in photoshop that will allow you to upscale it doesn't do it as well as, as stable diffusion does so if you're into your image manipulation um that could be the one for you okay so um let's go into let's dig a little bit into the nerd territory now um anybody heard of hugging face it has a whole load of models and data sets. So this is proper nerd stuff now. This is the real detail that sits. So these are elements that you would bolt together to create an AI tool, okay? So you can see, if you look at some of these things, depth, est depth estimation, uh, classification of images, separating images out, uh, classifying video content, you name it. So whatever, um, you know, kind of whatever, it's almost the out of the possible. I want to be able to look at an image and tell if it's, um, you know, kind of green. Um, give me a, let's build a tool to be able to do that. You can pull all of these, not only these models, these mini agents, if you like, together to do that, but you also got access to loads of data sets. So language models that are sitting there for you to experiment with. Now that, to be honest, is too deep for me i need to be at a slightly more superficial level so i'm at this level where i look at trials so all, all uh, so robert and and colleagues like robert will take some of these data sets and take some of the libraries and you know look at all the language models and things like that and say right okay i'm going to bring it together and i'm going to turn it into a little trial the out of the possible and you can download these and you can just run them in fact you don't even download a lot of them you just run them within a web window so i thought oh AI Comic Factory, 
that sounds exactly like what I'm interested in. So I tried this one, this AI comic factory, and it did this. And I'm going to zoom in. So it's picked out a few interesting things. All right. So here's here's a backstory to it, right? Who's the artist? It's Klimt. Klimt's my favorite artist. Okay. So what's the caption? Well, it's about Irish terriers. Tell us some themes or things of interest. Well, I really like illuminated manuscripts and Celtic knotwork. I thought, come on, let's throw all that in there. AI. Let's see how smart we are. See if you can give me something that's Klimt style that's got Irish terriers in it, but it looks like it's an illuminated manuscript or Celtic knotwork. And I tell you what, it but he pulled it off. Look at that. Brilliant. And in particular, we absolutely, me and Sarah love this. This is a snazzy little Celtic knotwork jacket in the style of Klimt for a dog. It's brilliant. But that's, and that, right, I kid you not, me keying that in, it took me about 10 seconds and in, and, and then it created that. So all whimsical stuff, but it, but it does, it really does show you, doesn't it, the power of it, um, of how large language models actually can pick out different things and plug them together to actually create something like this. So if you can have a look at that. This is an interesting one. I uh, took this Irish terrier wearing a Christmas hat. OK, and that's what the prompt was. And it generated this image. This is in uh, ChatGPT, so in Dali 3, right? Although I started off with only a few words, what it actually wrote was this. It's this is this is what the the description that ChatGPT created for me, which I thought was fascinating that it can suddenly expand it exponentially like that. But there is a feature that's in uh, ChatGPT that's down in the bottom left hand corner. So if you're in ChatGPT down in this corner where the Oxlep logo is, you'll see this, and there is custom instructions. If you tap on that custom instructions and open it up you've got two fields here and in these fields you put instructions about what how you want chat gpt to interpret what you say in the main chat area okay now there's a button down here that where you can click it on and off it's a it's a rocker switch if you click it on it means from now on every time you create a new uh, chat window it's going to look at that special information that you've given it and it will use that as a guiding principles, if you like, of how it responds to you. So it can be hugely powerful for you. Now, I, what I tend to do is turn it on and off. Uh, I, I use that rocker switch because I don't always want it to be on for everything because it can be too. Sometimes it can become something quite niche that you're you're asking it to do. Uh, but for consistency, and that's where the key to this is. So you don't forget to add that into your prompt because you could just put it into the main body of the request. It's just using up characters that you probably don't want to do because every language or every platform that uses large language models has a limitation about how many characters it can remember and process. So why would you put a ton of stuff in there um, into the main prompt area, knowing you're just using up unnecessary characters when you can put it into the custom instructions and not use up your allowance? So it's useful. Because actually what it does is when you, depending on what you put into, into the custom instructions, it changes it. So this is literally the next picture afterwards. So I created a custom prompt and then I created a new window and used exactly the same prompt. And this is what it generated, something completely different. And look, it's a much longer description. Um, it's got a cheerful demeanor now. Who knew? Who knew that, that uh, Irish Terriers had cheerful demeanors? But they do, according to AI. So that could be something quite useful for you to be able to do. Um, I'm going to carry on with prompts. So these are just for anybody who's not experienced of using things like ChatGPT and Claude and things like that is a prompt is an instruction. It's a request you make of, a, of an AI tool and it acts upon that and it will reference its language models and whatever systems and databases it has to actually try and respond to that and bring something back that's useful to you. Okay, so let's carry on with the prompts. And I love this one. So this is an emotion prompt. So I read this really fascinating white paper, although to be fair, I, I actually only read the abstract because I saw it on um, a uh, on Twitter where somebody had actually referenced this and said, this is amazing. So this is a, a research paper that was done talking about how large language models, which is basically, for want of a better term, chat GPT, can be influenced by using you using emotional language on it. OK, so. What I actually did was just before I show you like the impact of it, have a look at these pictures here. These are four pictures. So what's in the middle here? I'm going to zoom in on this is that. 
this is one of the power ups of this this the new thing in ChatGPT where you can actually bring in agents that have already been pre programmed with certain things. So this one is Glibertry Art Designer, which I absolutely love. You just enable it in ChatGPT. It's dead easy to do. Um, and then what it actually does is it produces four images and four different images. So that's what it did. Was so so uh, the prompt that I gave to it it, it was uh, produced for me uh, a robot looking wistfully into the future through a looking glass with one tear in its eye, and it generated four different images for me. Um, and I'm looking at it, and there's really only two of them have a tear in their eye. So the top two succeeded, the bottom two didn't. But it's fascinating all the same. Now that's just context, really. The main topic we're talking about here is the white paper itself. Now this white paper was fascinating because I think, well, it's just a, it's just a bit of technology. You know, this is entirely dispassionate. It's got no consciousness. Why, why, why could it possibly be affected? Can you really tug on its heartstrings? They did the research and it's been accepted as, you know, and, it, and it's been peer reviewed and it's been published as being accurate. So what they actually did was they looked at the original prompt and then added in an emotional prompt at the end of it. So this is just basically asking it a question seeing the, res the response time, how accurate it was, then doing it again, but adding in this phrase, this is very important to my career. So that, that remember that, this is very important to my career. Next time you're in one of these generative models, certainly the word um, generative models and the image ones, um, try adding that at the end of the request you're putting in. So uh, list the top 20 dog foods in the UK uh, by order of sales. Um, it's important you get this right for my career. Whatever it is, just put that in. Pl tug on the heartstrings and see if it works. Because according to this, this evidence here, it's a scale up of between eight percent and eleven percent in performance. That in actual fact, the large language models actually suddenly think, "Oh crikey, this is important to you. I better get this right. I better do a better job." Which sounds I don't know. It just sounds weird. So I thought I'm going to try it because, you know, I know it's been peer reviewed and it's a white paper coming from a trusted journal. But nonetheless, let's just see if it works. So. So I did. I did a little bit of an experiment. I had an image that was square, a square image for this workshop. And I thought, right, OK, let's test it. So I said, please make that square image 16 by nine ratio. So landscape and add these words. Quick poll. This request is really important for my career. So please don't let me down, I said. So what did it do? It actually generated it. It was it did do quick poll in both of them. So any of you that have ever used AI for image generation, it's a little bit hit and miss, isn't it? You don't, it doesn't always get the spellings right. And you'll see some examples later on where I don't know, it's just come up with some crazy stuff, really. It's just gobbledygook. But it worked. And I thought, ah, oh, that could be luck. That could be luck. So he got it right. I asked it to add the words quick poll in there. He got it right. So let's let's flip that experiment the other way around. So let's do it. Let's go backwards on it. So then I said, please make this one by one ratio. Make it back square and add these words. You give polls. So it got one right. You give polls. But then the other one is like, ah, can't be bothered. Can't spell. Give up. You know, one out of two, 50 percent hit rate. It's about as good as I can do. So I thought, ah, oh, it's interesting. OK, so suddenly it's got less accurate. So naturally, I thought I've got to carry on with this experiment. So let me see if I can get it to do it again, but add the emotional response in again. So please make this four by three ratio and add the words Oxlet polls. This request is really important for my career. So please don't let me down. So what did it do? It got it right again on both images. It spelt it right. But it got the ratio wrong. Suddenly it went, ah, oh, I can't do four by three anymore. I'm going to do it square. So it's one by one, but I can't, I can't do I can't do it. I'm exhausted. You know, you've asked too much of me. But it is interesting that it does work. So a judicious use of the right wording can actually make a significant difference to so not only imagery, but also written pieces of content as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some really useful platforms. If you're, uh, if, you know, if, if like me, you know, you're not the greatest wordsmith, so you can talk a good game, but you can't write a good game. That's me. Um, sometimes I need help to come up with these ideas for, you know, creating prompts. So let's have a look at some of these ideas. So this one is from prompts.chat. And what these this does is this produces a series of prompts that's asking you to almost almost like method acting. You're telling the, uh, the GPT, you're telling the AI tool what it is. I want you to act as a film critic. 
you will need to watch a movie and review it in an articulate way, providing both positive and negative, blah, 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 that sort of thing. Or, or this one. I want you to act as a classical music punk composer. Now, they all have this same thing. You're saying who they are, what what their experience is, and what you want them to do. Now, this particular website is absolutely superb. It has thousands of these, and it's searchable. So you can search by any particular category to find things. So I thought, well, OK, I'm going to uh, give that one a go. Um, so I actually went into the second prompt generator, which is actually on Hugging Face, and thought, let's let's see if it can help create one of these prompts from the first section for me. Because I couldn't find something that was perfect here on prompts.chat, whereas this website, Hugging Face Spaces Merv, all you have to do is give it a really simple little prompt, and it will come up with that really creative thing for you. So... The input persona, what is it? So I've said a wildlife photographer of the year using large format Hasselblad camera and Zeiss lens, spelled incorrectly. And what it said was, okay, here is the prompt. I want you to act as a wildlife for the daddy, 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 da. So it suddenly fleshed out the detail here. This, this is the prompt I needed, okay? This is exactly what I needed to then be able to create the image. So I did. I actually said, there you go, create me an image that, that has an Irish terrier in it. And, and it did. And it made it look like it had been taken by a world famous photographer using a Hasselblad with a Zeiss lens. So whimsical stuff for images, but it but it can work with words as well. Um, if you want to, if you have, for example, you've written an article and you want to write, have it written in a slightly different style. Maybe you've done War and Peace on your website or maybe you've written, you yourself have written a really interesting re a white paper and you think it's kind of it's all there but I don't know how to rewrite it and I don't know how to make it so that it, it would fit into, you know, whatever uh, wall street press, or if I wanted to see this published in a lifestyle magazine, how, how would I rewrite that? Well, you, you, you create the prompt, you say who the person is that they're an author of a uh, home and country magazine um, who has editorial control over the content that goes into it. Uh, I will provide you an article on the following. Um, please ensure that it fits with your current guidelines and, and it has the right tone and style for your publication. Paste in your white paper, your content, and then it will rewrite that in that style, which then it might not be the finished article for you, but it will certainly take your content and just reposition it in a slightly different way and allow you to at least look at it and reflect on it and say, yeah, actually, I mean, it's all there. And I've never really thought about it being rewrote like that. So, it, you know, this is again, coming back to the idea of some AI is novel in, in the way in which it can take your, your information and it can say, right, okay, I understand all of that. Now, based on my experience and my language models where I've seen similar, you know, data set or pieces of information put together, it could be quite useful actually if, if we just reword this or just move these things around and position it like that and say, bang, like that. That's that's probably, that's what good would look like in, in its opinion. And then you can say, yeah, fine. Or you can just go iterative versions of it. But again, remember, with things like ChatGPT and BARD and, and all the others, they actually get quite exhausted. So they run out of energy and they become less accurate over time. So when you feel you've done a few passes, sometimes it's good to just create a new chat window, start again with where you left off because it starts to deviate. You know, you, you may have heard of things like AI hallucinations. They do. They make things up. So you have to be really careful of that. Um, and the more the more you fatigue that particular chat window and use up the you know available characters in it, uh, the higher the likelihood is that it's not going to process things correctly and it will make more mistakes. Okay, so let's have a look at this, which is an, another version of uh, prompt creation. So this one here um, is a number of different types of prompts that you can use to actually create these, which are the messages down here. Um, you're pasting these straight into Dali, um, into Mid Journey, into any any of the uh, the other ones that I've already shown you. Uh, but what's interesting about this is, it in this particular platform, it gives you a whole series of prompts to create images of very different styles. So I did it for good old Irish terriers. So what it actually created for me in ChatGPT or in Dali within ChatGPT, it created an Irish terrier as a word mark, 
an Irish Terry as a pictorial mark and an Irish Terry as an emblem or logo. And he did it all in one go. Yeah, bing, bing, bing. There you go. There's all three of them. So and that just came from me finding the right prompt generator in here to then paste that into ChatGPT DALI 3. And then it went bing, bing, bing. And there's lots of examples of how useful that uh, that can be to just... You know, if if you're trying to create a logo for yourself or for a client, you know, just to look at it and say, well, do we want something as flat and playful as that? Or, you know, do we want something slightly more old fashioned and woodcut like? Or, you know, do, do we want this to be quite stark and fresh and vector like? So it just gives you loads of different ways of interpreting that same one particular image. And of course, and I'm really sorry for anybody who is a, a graphic designer, um, it's my recommendation is embrace AI as soon as it's reasonably practicable because, you know, the days of uh, being able to charge a client 500 quid for a logo were uh, a long gone, I'm afraid, um, unless you're using AI yourself as a tool and that you're able to generate tons of ideas for them and then allow them to make the right choice because then the investment of your time in using an AI tool to create content and curate that and put it back to them and say, well, any of these, okay, let me go back and let me now, now use this color palette. And how about we try it like this? You can go through iterative examples of that, generate lots of it. And you're probably going to get to a point where the client's really happy with it. You consume the same number of hours and then maybe you can justify spending that. But remember, what I'm showing you here is ways in which you can do this yourself. And oh, there's a sort of slight tad of guilt I have uh, in doing that. But, uh, but hey, you know, don't shoot the guy who's just told you about it. I didn't make it. <laughs> That's my disclaimer on that one. Um, as if to make matters worse, I'm so sorry, Ant. This is, just to be clear, this, this is not Oxlep doing any kind of plagiarism here. To be absolutely clear, this is on me, this one. But uh, what I did was, I uh, there's a feature in ChatGPT where you can upload an image. And if you upload the image, it tells you something about it. So I uploaded the Coca-Cola logo. And I said, oh, and, it, and it basically said, oh, you've shared the iconic logo for Coca-Cola. So it recognized it, which is brilliant. And I did it for loads of logos. And he recognized them. I did it for the Kodak one to create the Google image earlier that I was showing you for the Kodak moment. Um, so this one, in this particular example, it was it was Coca-Cola. So I uploaded this and, you know, let it do its thing. And it did this lovely description. And then I said to it, right, OK, so thanks. Thanks for that great description. Now, I want you to create generate a logo similar to this based on a prompt. Um that I can actually take into Dali and then use, because at that point when I was doing this, they were two separate things. So you you had to create the prompt in one and then you had to take it into the other and then, and then create the image. So it did. Based on that, it went, oh, okay, there you go. Let's create an original logo featuring the brand name Cola Enjoy. I didn't give it that. I just hallucinated that. I did not tell it that. But what I actually did was I copied all of that text, but I changed Cola Enjoy to, what could you imagine I could possibly change it to? Irish Terriers. So I created an Irish Terriers logo that kind of looks a little bit like Coca-Cola. I, I understand that it's possible to refine this to actually get it to look almost exactly the same, but for the out of the possible and also for just out of um, appropriateness, I stopped at this point, but it's quite interesting how well it was able to take a logo, understand its form, describe that in words, then for me to then put that into another language model, for then to interpret those words and turn it into something that actually isn't a million miles away, really. Admittedly, it's got bigger key lines around it and it's not exactly the same, but it's not far off, to be honest. So if you haven't got the full paid for version of GPT, you might want to get on the internet. And if you try and go on the internet, it's going to tell you, oh, you can't do it. I, I apologize, but I don't, I can't access specific articles. There is this really uh, good uh, web chat tool that you can, if you're on, if you use Chrome, that will allow your uh, GPT 3.5 to access the internet. And when you do that, then it does actually find the articles and bring it up. And I checked, and this was, this was the day after the AI summit. Uh, when I did this particular slide and I thought, okay, let's see if it actually didn't, man, bang, it did produce those articles. And just as testimony, I'm showing you the screenshot of the one in the corner there. And it's here that when you install this, you'll notice it's this bit here, web access. It's a rocker switch, a little bit like the other one. You can turn it on and off because sometimes it's a bit annoying, to be fair. Um, so you want to keep it on all of the time, but it has loads of other um, advanced features and, and customization that you can do in there. But, you know, if you're serious about using ChatGPT, just like, just pay. And then you won't need to worry about that because it's just built into it anyway. Uh, or use some of the other, you know, kind of tools that I'm going to show you in a short while. So we've looked at lots of different ways that you can create images. So let's think about layout. So if you're a designer, um, you're maybe going to design posters, business cards, whatever it's going to be. 
here's some here's some good tools. Looker is a brilliant AI tool. Canva, most of you probably are aware of. And Canva actually has a bolt on now to uh, OpenAI's DALI so that not only will it, and if you can connect your account to it, it will, you know, you give it a prompt and it will say, oh, OK, I know what you want. Right. You could, if you, you could use this template to do it, would you like me to would you like me to show you where that is and what it would look like? So it's a good bolt on to it. If you don't have a Canva account, um, it's not going to matter uh, because it will generate images for you. But if you're not in ChatGPT, but you want to go to the Canva tool itself, canva.com, uh, happy days. It's got a whole AI area and it's very good at creating things. Very good indeed. So we've got MS Designer, freebie. We like free. Remember I was talking to you before about the whole ecosystem of Microsoft. It's all going AI, Copilot will be all over this uh, image generation, uh, content creation, uh, design tools. Uh, this one I do like, Place It, made by Envato, because this is where if you're in the visual merchandising world or if you want to see your logos on books or or on objects for maybe you're going to write an annual report and you want your logo in the corner of a glass or something like that, that's what this tool does. It actually, using AI, it will take logos, Irish Terriers, of course, uh, and it will superimpose it onto bags, tags, and shirts for you. So nice, easy tools to use. OK, so I've talked about chat, chat BT, but there are others. So we've got Google Bard, which is brilliant. It's a great search tool. Uh, it doesn't have any plugins at the minute. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, they didn't really want to bring out Google Bard, but their hand was forced because OpenAI just like, went crazy with it. Um, OpenAI is our second one. It's a GPT-4 now. Interesting thing about GPT is... Um, Somebody was talking about IQ, so like uh, verbal reasoning IQ, and they said, so what? what's the average IQ of a person in the UK? And they said, oh, it's probably about 100. So, okay. And what what's the IQ, verbal reasoning IQ of, of GPT 3.5? And so what it's typical to say, it's, there's no exact science to it. Oh, okay. What about GPT 4? And I said, oh, it's about 150, 155. Okay, so what about Einstein? Oh, he's at about between 160 and 170. So why are you saying that GPT-4 is almost as clever as I say? Ah, it's not, not as clear-cut as that. So what's the difference between GPT-4 and 3.5? Well, GPT-4 is tenfold, ten times the the capability of GPT-3.5. So, okay, so if you're saying GPT-4 is 155, does that mean then that GPT-3.5 is 15? Yeah, but you can't really, it doesn't work like that. Okay, so what about GPT-5, the next one? Uh, is it going to be tenfold increase? Yes, it's a tenfold increase. Okay, so if you're saying GPT-4 is currently 155, are you really saying that the next version will have an IQ of 1,500, 1,500, which would make it four times smarter than the smartest person ever recorded? Yeah, I think that's what we're saying. So when when you start to think about it like that, you can see why some of the people on the board of OpenAI are getting slightly concerned about the direction of travel and the rate at which GPTs are, are increasing in terms of their capability. Because we, you know, kind of run the risk of actually generating creating tools that are smarter than the smartest people that ever lived. Uh, but anyway, we are where we are. Claude, I mentioned Claude's flawed. I'm afraid um, it's good, but it's it's. It's getting better. Let's put it that way. You know, Google have thrown a lot of money at it. These people came from OpenAI. They're they're thoroughly nice people, but it's slightly flawed. Uh, <laughs> HyperWrite, I really like, right? And the reason why I like HyperWrite is the first point on here. Explain like I'm five. It's a fantastic, it's a, it's, a, it's exactly the same as ChatGPT and all the others. But you can actually ask it to explain things as a five-year-old. And it does a brilliant job of anything so whatever your area of expertise whatever your uh, industry that you're in think of one of the most complex parts of of your industry go to hyperwrite and ask it to explain it to you like you're a five-year-old it's brilliant it does a really good job so it's a little bit fun a bit whimsical uh, but it does have other features in there so, you know that it will you know kind of help curate your content and make it more appropriate uh, jasper's a great tool if you if you're a marketeer uh, because it kind of aligns brand values, you can upload all of your assets to it and it starts to detect your tone of voice and it starts to make suggestions to keep everything aligned, which is something that other GPTs don't do a good job at. They kind of wander wistfully on the breeze. Uh, you can you know, obviously, you know, kind of use uh, the back end of some of these to actually try and hold them together, but they really struggle with it. Whereas Jasper, that's that's the, their key uh, competitive advantage. 
you chat's popular outside of the uk for some reason it's not particularly popular here but it, it's built on two things it's using stable diffusion for its images and chat gpt for its words so it's got a good following and it has good assistant value in there but I've tried the free version and it's all right, but I'm told by users that the, the paid for version is brilliant. Um, and then the free one, which started off the whole arms race and, and spooked Google is Llama, which is a meta, um, you know, kind of open source uh, large language model. And you'll see this uh, in some of the links that we're going to send to you. There's some really neat little tools where you can actually try this out. And it, and it is very good. And of course, it has democratized language models for lots of developers. So I mentioned earlier that I'm not I'm a good talker, but I'm not a great writer. And um, there are certain tools that can help people. So my grammar is appalling. Uh, I always make typos. I'm sure you've seen that in my slides. Hold my hands up. I just I just don't know. Just can't get it right, despite my best efforts. So I lean on certain AI tools and this one, Quillbot is the one that I lean on a lot. I really like Quillbot because it helps me if I've got to write that difficult email, if I need to proofread what I've just said, if I'm going to do a post or if I'm going to create some content and I just want to make sure that I haven't mangled it and that it reads not like my brain, but how somebody might understand it better, their brain works, then that's exactly what Quillbot does. So you simply put text into it and you've got drop downs to actually choose how you want it to understand your words and reinterpret it. So you've got standard model. So improve the fluency, make it more formal, make it, you know, sound like you're a, you've got a PhD, simplify it. Yeah. Just like deburr it, be more creative, you know, make it more flowery, make it longer. Cause I run out of talent and I've only got 20 words in there and it should be 200 words. Actually, it won't increase it that much, but you can do a lot of different things. And what it actually does is, so you paste into the left-hand side, or on the right-hand side, it gives you a version of it, but it will give you several. But what it's actually doing is where it's highlighted a word in colour, and it might be difficult to see that. Let me just zoom in a little bit for the benefit of anybody who's got a smaller screen. Where it's orange, it's suggested new words. And if you right-click on those words, it, it brings you up like a thesaurus, if you like. And if you select it, it then, depending on which one you've chosen, you might say, oh, gosh, you chose that word. Mm, I might need to change a few of the other words now that you've chose that word. So it will start to update it in real time based on where you start to make selections. But it's fascinating stuff. And honestly, for me, as I say, um, where I get my grammar wrong and I make lots of typographical errors, this has reduced my anxiety massively. So if you work in a business and perhaps you've got colleagues or maybe you you employ people within your business and maybe they they're like me and despite best efforts they still make you, you see whatever you read it's just like ah oh, gosh i wish you'd spell check that um consider whether or not you might give them access to quillbot so that they can use it the way that i use it because i just know that anybody who has that challenge of not getting the words out right it comes with tremendous anxiety just before you press the send button. You almost do it with one eye shut because you just know no matter how many times I've read this, I bet I've got it wrong. OK, so from a sensitivity point of view, uh, from a leadership point of view, Quillbot could be a tool that you could use. Now, it, it is free. Um, and if it's free, you get a couple of choices, OK, uh, which are perfectly adequate for what you want to do. Um, if you do the paid for version, then obviously you get the expanded set. Uh, and if you're a nerd or if you're a wordsmith, I'm sure there are some on the call, it starts to show you, depending on which one you choose and how it changes, it starts to show you what's happened. <laughs> Quite interesting actually on this example, because I pasted in this content, which I think came from the website itself. I just copied it and I said, oh, let's go academic. So then it did an academic version of it. So it suddenly started talking about widespread discourse or, you know, I, I keep putting uh, on, on um, you know, kind of uh, silly voices when I start to read this because they go, oh, it's quite you know pompous in the way it's done it because I think it thinks that's how academics speak. But look what it's actually done to readability. So it actually what was originally there from their website had a readability of 73 percent. Now, by making it academic, boom, it's now 33 percent readable. So it actually hasn't improved it from that point of view. And that really just simply comes down to what the context is, what the topic is that you're using, that will change things, okay? So other real world uses of that, um, in my on my website, 
Uh, I use AI for all my Google reviews. So if you went to my website, you will see that I've got all my Google business reviews that come out here. And there's a bot that sits in there that auto generates a summary of, of that. So it's basically curating all of the content that people have said about me over time. It's brilliant. It's a free tool. So if you have a website, you know, elfsite.com, Google reviews, widget, we'll give you the link at the end. Um, put it on your website but i mean brilliant because it's the it's a real authentic voice you know if you need testimonials and you want it to be truthful there's nothing better pretty much than google business because you can't change the reviews they are as they are now interestingly i was putting a post on linkedin this morning and while i was on there i spotted this thing down in the corner here look at this enhance your profile with the help of ai i've never seen that before uh, obviously it was tempting me by saying go on it's not going to cost you anything go on go on go on go on do it do it but i didn't didn't dare uh, but it looks like the AI now is embedded into LinkedIn and it's going to improve. I don't know if anybody here has uh, used that yet, but if you have, uh, let, put in the chat your experiences of using LinkedIn as a, you know, enhancement tool. Okay. So um, talked earlier about when it comes to uh, challenges some of us have, uh, which is with words. Uh, there are might be some people who are visually impaired. There's a brilliant tool, Be My Eyes. And they've developed an AI tool now um, that's called Be My AI, which is actually for anybody who's visually impaired, which I think is absolutely brilliant. Um, so I just took this from their website. So it shows a whole load of different ways that it actually can take a feed from your camera and you can verbally reason with it and it will talk back to you. It will tell you what it's seeing. And it's so you can hold it in front of gadgets and devices. Maybe, you know, here's something, I wear spectacles. And even though I've got really high power spectacles, there are certain things where I look at and I say, I can't even read that. Well, actually be my eyes or be my AI can actually be an aid for that because it acts like a magnifying glass. It can see what it can read, what's on there. And then it can, and and then you can say, I need to do this, and and then it will help you to be able to do that. So tremendous tool. It's obviously got OpenAI embedded into it. Um, I think if you know anybody who has a visual impairment, they might benefit from that. So we're going to just finish off today's session just thinking about a little bit of research. So um, I've got three research tools here: perplexity, size, space, and illicit. Now these are a bit niche, to be fair but I wanted to be reasonable and tell all of you about these very different things. So perplexity um, is a, it's basically a little bit like chat GPT, but it actually, it's not sensationalist. It doesn't lie. And it always gives you references, real references to web pages in there. So you can see, I just put in Euralink in human trial and then boom, there it is. It tells you all about it. And then it gives you some references to reliable references to the Verge, Reuters. So reliable news sources So not like your, I don't know, whatever dot coms, but uh, ones that you can trust. Um, Sciespace is a great one. If you are Maybe you're generating lots of white papers and you simply almost want to create your own language model or your own ability to be able to create a knowledge base and then talk to that knowledge base and say, based on what you now know about our research, we want X, Y and Z. So it's, it's and you can reason with it as well. So have I got this right? Well, actually, and what it can actually do is it can say, well, based on your previous research paper, you, you, you clearly changed direction or there is there's some anomalies in that. Let me identify those anomalies for you. So um, size space can be good. I appreciate this is not for everybody, but I just want to be fair and reasonable to everybody. And then the final one is illicit in this section, which is all about automating tasks and taking information out and then understanding it and reinterpreting it. And of course, be me, I thought, right, breeding Irish terriers. So um, I thought, what can you tell, illicit, what can you tell me about it? So I just put in breeding Irish terriers. It had a look, it found four research papers here, which then I can then, double click on and then explore and then find out if any of them are relevant. If I myself was going to write a, you know, a, a paper on that particular topic. Okay, gang, any of you that are involved in um, website development or you just want to just look at an idea, I just want to sort of see out of the possible, I've got a logo, I've got a few words. Well, Hey Layer is brilliant at it. So it's made by Bradio. So basically from a series of simple questions, it will create a website for you and it does a really good job. So I did this, uh, I it asked me 10 questions and at the end of it, I had an Irish Terriers website. Um, admittedly, I didn't get around to uploading any photographs in there. So it's simply based on um, 
what it actually had in its stock images. But anyway, it's got a shamrock, which is good. It's got it actually has got my one of my Dali images down in the bottom corner here. But this is a website that it just generated from 20 questions. Um, obviously, it puts, you know, images of Ireland, Lucky Shamrock, uh, Irish Wolfhound, not quite a terrier, but there you go. Somebody with red hair, um, Tullamore Jew, knew me too well. Uh, but it gives you a really good starting point to be able to visualize it. And then you can then start going in and adding more more content to it, changing it, personalizing it. The advantage of this is that it's a really quick way of you being able to take an idea and then just simply putting it in um, to a web developer proper. And that's, I think, from a from a decency point of view, that's what I would suggest you do. Use something like this to actually say, this is sort of what I want it to look like, but I just need you to do a better job. Um, so you can share the link to that, to them. They can say, oh, yeah, okay, I know what you want. All right, I can, I can build, I can do a proper job on that. Now, I know you can do it with Wix, but you've also got to spend ages in there farting around with it. Well, this doesn't need it. It's simply doing it from prompts. So it's very, very quick for you to be able to do it. Okay, so um, stuff that I couldn't get around to doing today, and who knows, maybe we'll do one in the future that's all about sound and video, I don't know, but there is some fantastic resources for you to go and find tons of AI tools. Here's two super tools and future tools that just have gazillions of things, and you sign up to their newsletters if you're really interested in it, and you're going to just get a whole load of new ideas coming towards you. Okay, so recommend that you do that. Um, it's going to finish off on you know, a little bit of reflection, really. Um, change is coming. We know that. Um, I talked earlier about displacement of work and, and the evolution of, of life in general through all of these different, um, you know, kind of unique practices that are all coexisting. So I asked uh, AI to help me out in this self-reflective phase. You know, where are we? Where are we going? How can we and AI coexist? And ChatGPT said, Collaborate with AI to en enhance your own potential. So it's all about you. That's what AI is saying. It's like, and you know, empower yourself through with the help of AI. Uh, Google Bard said, don't know, mate. I, I couldn't possibly answer that one. It wouldn't be drawn on it. And I really tried. And it was like, no, I'm just a language model. I couldn't, I have nothing to say on that particular topic, which I found really interesting. But Meta, I, you know, go, uh, Facebook's Meta, Llama 2, I quite liked. He said, focus on tasks that require creativity, empathy, and critical thinking. That's like the coping mechanism for the future in the view of AI intelligence. Um, the futurists have some common themes that they talk about, about remaining curious and being willing to adapt to change, using AI as a tool, scale down your expectations, which works well with net zero. We'll all have to do that. Um, help your kids to adapt. They tend to anyway, but don't let them get left behind because it's your children's future, not yours, really. I mean, the majority of us on this call will just roll with it. Uh, but young people will need to and will indeed adapt to it quite quickly. And if you've got any kind of anxiety or any kind of concern about this thing, there are more mentoring and support tools that have been created if you want AI to provide you with some level of comfort <laughs> there's a certain irony to that but we are we are where we are um here's a tool called better coach uh which is just that it's an ai coach that you can just talk to and sound out ideas and reflect on that um it's up to you really uh i think human contact is the most important thing uh, i think business networking is absolutely critical and the closer we can stay to each other um um would make this world a better place in general anyway even if ai is or is not involved um i'm going to give the last word to this gentleman which is an ai version of stan boardman the liverpoolian comedian and back in 1986 he actually said this on a frankie goes to hollywood album and I, I memorized this and little did i know that it would become so prophetic to where we are today uh, in the coming age of automation where people might eventually work only 10 or 20 hours a week, man for the first time will be forced to confront himself with the true spiritual problems of living. Now, that is in 1986 that they were talking about automation and how we would go into a self-reflective stage of like existential, you know, kind of existence and who are we and how is all this going to work? Um 444 months ago, that was. I thought, oh, 444. Four, four. Let's see what Chat GPT says about that. What is the spiritual significance of the number 444? I asked ChatGPT, and little did I know that 444 has spiritual significance. So there we go. Uh, just a little bit of light ending, but 444 is, is considered to be an, a repetitive or angel number. And in particular, the fours represent awakening and enlightenment. 
So we're on the right path for personal achievement. And I wish you well on that journey. And let's let's make it our friend rather than our enemy. Uh, that's it for me. Uh, any questions?